So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, yeah. So my name is uh, Stuart Holmes, and I'm the president of EYFDM, which is the European Young Family Doctors Movement. Sure. Um, so today's uh, webinar is a collaboration between um, ourselves, the EYFDM, and also uh, the Emergency Medicine Special Interest Group of Wonka World. Um, so the um, these this series of webinars is organised by the the global uh, Wonka Young Doctors Movement, and the president of of Wonka Young Doctors, uh, Sanka, wanted to be here, um, but unfortunately he cannot join as he's in South America. Um, so I'll just read out a message from him, and then we'll get started. Um, so I guess um, if you're not speaking to present, if you could keep your microphone off, that would be really helpful. Um, and also, if you want interp interp interpretation in either in either Mandarin or Chinese, if you go to the bottom of the screen, um, beside reactions, there's a button which says interpretation. And you can choose to hear live interpretation in either Spanish or Chinese. Um, so I'll just read out the message from Sanka, who can't be here, um, and then I'll hand over to the emergency medicine team and we'll get started. So uh, Sanka wanted to say, dear young doctor colleagues around the world, uh, greetings for, from Colombia. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining this webinar organized by EYFDM the Wonka Young Doctor Movement in Europe in collaboration with the Special Interest Group on Emergency Medicine. This is our seventh collaborative webinar. Um, emergency medicine is one of the most important areas that should be practiced by all family doctors as it is directly related to first contact care and can be life-saving. Um, in addition, family doctors in some countries are an integral part of emergency departments and in countries like Nepal, emergency medicine is solely practiced by GPs. Um, so it is part of their postgraduate training. So therefore, it's it's um, of the utmost importance that we understand the subject. Today's webinar um, has been inclu has includes very interesting and relevant topics for all family doctors. Um, and as a member of the team, I saw the hard work put on by the organizers. And I'd like to sincerely appreciate the work led by Elena and Stuart. Congratulations. Thank you. And I hope that the participants will grab the most of this useful webinar. So that was the words from Sanka on the right. Um, and yep, we're glad to have you with us. And I'll hand over to Elena, who will take it from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Okay, guys. So very, very welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Elena, and uh, I am the chair of the Wonka Special Interest Group on Emergency Medicine. And I would like to tell you a couple of things about us. Uh, first of all, to present our incredible team. Uh, these two guys uh, are Roshan from Nepal and Miriam from Bolivia, and uh, they are our small young candidates um, uh, from the Young Doctors Movement to represent this movement in the Wonka Special, uh, special Group on Emergency Medicine. And uh, here we would like to say very, very warm thank you to these beautiful two girls, Komali and Chloe, who are our colleagues and our interpreters in Chinese and Spanish. And uh, here we are, and we are the joint team uh, of the Wonka Special Interest Group on Emergency Medicine and uh, the foundators of a great project uh, on ultrasound, which is starting to be organized in the Young Doctors Movement of uh, Europe. IFDM. Uh, so now we start our webinar already officially. 
And uh, I would like to explain you just one concept, very imp important concept for us is Wonka Emergency uh, Special Interest Group. And this is uh, that our group includes family doctors who are passionate about emergencies from all over the world. And therefore we wanted to adapt the content of our webinar to different levels of complexity, which can be useful for the doctors with different level of knowledge requirements. It depends on the profile of the work of family doctors in each given country, their involvement in the response to emergent pathologies with different levels of complexity, the infrastructure uh, of each region's health system and the economic capacity to provide its professionals with means of diagnosis and intervention. So we know that the emergency medicine made by family doctors is not the same in Spain, in England, in India, in Nepal, in mountainous regions of Bolivia or oh, large rural territories oh, of Australia. And uh, the service uh, portfolio uh, that a family doctor who works in emergency can offer in each country is very, very different. For this reason, we wanted to offer a material for different levels of difficulty, uh, as well as present you a selection of typical health problems chosen by professionals from different regions of the world. We hope you will like the diversity of our material uh, and especially its presenters and the lively and vibrant spirit of our group. To begin, I would like to introduce you to our young colleagues from a uh, European movement of young family doctors. They are the heart of ultrasound group project. It is their first appearance on the Wonka stage and I invite you to give them the warmest welcome and all your support. The project coordinator, Dr. Eva Leciaga from Catalonia, Spain, couldn't be with us this afternoon, but I give the word to her team, the core block of the group, that we hope will soon be an official IFDM working group. And uh, the stage is yours, Anna. Thank you, Elena. I am. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we are presenting, first of all, the ultrasound EYFDM team. And we are going to teach you some of the basics uh, of the ultrasound for emergency department. So next, please. This is the index, the program we are following today. We are first speaking about the basic principles, then the indications of the ultrasound in emergency departments, and last but not least, the, the EFAS protocol for polytrauma and the RASH protocol for shock. Next, thank you. This is our team, the ultrasound team. Uh, first one is me uh, in the left, uh, I'm Anna. The next one is Ravi, which is teaching us the FAST protocol. This one is Drago, which is going to teach us the RUSH protocol. And the last one is Eva, uh, the person who was the main organizer of this, but couldn't attend in the last moment. So that's it. Thank you. Well, first of all, we are going we are gonna to talk about the choosing the right ultrasound probe based on application. Next, please. There are only three kinds of probes in the ultrasound system, and uh, we would like to begin for the first one, which is the smallest one. It's the sectorial one for just for the cardiac images, and you just have to remember that it's so small that you can peep between the ribs, so it's just only used for the for cardiac images. The last one, uh, the C one, it's called the convex one, which is the deepest one. Uh, it's only used, well, it's used for abdominal cavity. Um, sorry, yeah, it's used for the abdominal cavity. And if you don't remember, if you, you're you not used to it, just remember that it has like a belly. So it's for the belly, okay? And the one in the middle, the sectorial one, the linear one, it's just uh, flat, like the, like the skin, because it's for superficial structures, such as anything that it's just below the skin, or for example, the thyroid which is so superficial, right on the neck. Next one, please. Yeah, uh, we would like you to remember from anatomy classes, the three main planes of the human body, right? Uh, the coronal one, just uh, also called the frontal plane, 
the sagittal one, which is just in the middle, and the last one, which is the transverse plane. It's my favorite because whenever, if you're not used to the ultrasound image, you can always compare it to a CT scan because it's the same image you get from a CT scan. So it's easier to compare it. Uh, then in the image below, you have to remember every, every probe has a marker, an indicator, a small light that gives us the, like the hint to remember where are we, because we can see the light in the probe and we can also see an image, a red point in the, on the screen. So we remember where are we going or where are we coming from. We have three kinds of moves of movements from the probe. The first one is next, Elena, because it's not moving the image, sorry. Yeah, no, before. The, that's it, because it's a video. Sliding on a surface, you just slide it, right? Tilting, which is you get the probe from here, from the top, and just tilt in the same, you have to stick it to a point and then move it towards the front and to the back, just like this like this, if you cannot see, yeah? And then rotating, you can, as you rotate the probe, you can change from a transversal image to a sagittal one, okay? Next one, please. Yeah, there are lots of buttons on the ultrasound computer on the console, but we only have to remember, like there are few of them that can give us the opportunity to adjust the depth, the focus, the gain and also we can freeze the image or to take a picture or to compare to do some measures in the ultrasound and the most important one i think is the color doppler one because it makes you uh for example when you have like a transverse cut from a vase you don't know if it's a vase if it's a fist or something and you use the ultrasound doppler and you say okay there's fluid inside that it's coming to me or there's fluid that is going to the opposite di direction. So you can you can differentiate if it's a blood vessel or if it's another structure. Okay, next one. And then these are like the basic uh, names, the basic terminologies or ultrasound. You have to remember that wherever is anechoic means it's pitch black, like nothing can nothing of the ultrasound can go in there so it's liquid the the opposite would be hyperechoic which means it's brighter like mm, bright white like metal or uh, bones for example and then there are other two terminologies there are isoechoic which means two structures have the same the same color the same texture the same echogenicity echogenicity right like for example the spleen and the kidney and Hypoechoic, which means some structure is hypoechoic, it's darker than the other one. For example, the liver is hypoechoic, it's darker than the right kidney, if you can see it in the picture. Right? Okay, next one. And well, these are some of the indications of the ultrasound, uh, as you can see or you can read in the slide. There are so many of them, just pulmonary, cardiac. Uh, vascular uh, in some kind of patients such as shock patients or abdominal pathologies. So let's go for the next one, please. And give your turn, uh, Ravi. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Ravi. So let's start using ultrasound in emergency. Our first case is a polytrauma patient. So it's uh, an 18 year old male uh, was transferred to the emergency department after having a motorcycle accident with multiple contusions. Next, please. Uh, in order to assess a bullet trauma patient, we can use this algorithm. So ultrasound uh, scan, the FAST protocol, can help identify general region of bleeding in trauma. Uh, imagine an unstable patient with FAST positive, means bleeding, uh, should go directly to, to the operating room. If the patient is stable, we can do a CT scan. An uh, unstable patient with a negative FAST, we still need a CT scan to diagnose area of bleeding. And if the patient is stable, we can observe and repeat the, uh, the e FAST to reevaluate. Next, please. Next, please. OK. So the e FAST stands for Extended Focused Assessment with Sonography and Trauma. 
So it detects pericardial effusion, uh, hemoperitoneum, and pneumothorax within the emergency department. Uh, there are many uh, different sequences for the EFAST. We choose this one, we chose this one. You can choose what, uh, whatever suits you, but just make sure not to forget any of the views while doing the exam. So we'll use the same transducer during the exam. Uh, it's the convex probe uh, with a preset of fast or abdominal. We start with number one. So it's the cardiac or sub uh, view. It answers the question, does our patient has, um, have a fluid in the pericardium? So for this view, you point the probe indicator towards the patient's head and aim the beam towards the patient's left shoulder. You can, uh, as you can see uh, here, um, there's an area, a black area and a coic area around the heart, uh, which indicates the, uh, he has a pericardial effusion. Next, please. So for the next two views, um, the number two and number three, remember to look for free fluid, both above the diaphragm and below the diaphragm. So above for hemothorax and below for hemo hemoperitoneum. Uh, so number two is the right upper quadrant view. This is usually the most sensitive view of the EFAST exam because uh, since the liver uh, is the most common, uh, commonly injured um, organ. So maybe our patient has an injury liver and we can detect here if he has the, uh, the problem. So the probe indicator towards the patient's head also, uh, uh, again, sorry, in the mid axillary line at the uh, 10th intercostal space. We can here um, see the black area um, in the hepatorenal space or the Morrison pouch uh, where it's usually identified free fluid. Next, please. And moving to the third, number three, uh, the left upper quadrant view. The question here is our patient has a free fluid in the abdomen or the, the left thorax. So again, the probe indicator towards the patient's head and uh, in the, sorry, in the in posterior axillary line in the eighth uh, intercostal space. And free fluid is most frequently seen in the perisplenic um, space, the Morrison, uh, sorry, the perisplenic splenic space between the spleen and the diaphragm, as shown here in the uh, the photo below. So next, please. Okay. Now number four is the uh, the fourth view is the pelvic view. So it answers the question, does my patient have a free fluid in the abdomen or pelvis? Um, it's important here to consider the sex of the patient, if your patient, as free fluid has a tendency to accumulate in different locations, depending on the patient gender. So you, you, uh, you point the indicator towards the patient head, in the longitudinal view in the patient midline, uh, right above the pubic uh, symphysis, and you tilt the probe to point down towards the pelvic cavity. Um, so uh, you have uh, in the uh, lower uh, image um, at the right, you have uh, for the transverse view, you center the bladder um, as in before, and then rotate the transducer 90 degrees counterclockwise. And you have this uh, to uh, till the indicator uh, points to the right of the patient. So in the in the uh, in uh, male patients, you uh, the free fluids can f be found in the rectal vesical uh, boat, uh, the longitudinal view. And in females, uh, you can identify the uh, rectal uterine boat. Which, which is the pouch of Douglas, uh, where you can find free fluid in the pathological exam. Next, please. And finally, we go to the lung views to identify if our patient has a pneumothorax. 
you point the indicator towards the patient's head in the mid-clavicular line at the second intercostal space uh, to the right and the left lung, respectively. So this point is the most uh, sensitive spot for looking for pneumothorax in the supine patient. But first, the um, ultrasound finding to confirm you are in the correct position is to look for the two ribs shadow, uh, the black area uh, below the bat, and uh, which is the bat wing sign. So here um, you look for uh, the lung sliding. Uh, if you may, the next please, so we can see the video. So now it's moving, so it's uh, the lung sliding during respiration. Um, if lung sliding is present, you can rule out pneumothorax um, at that ultrasound point. And that's it. Ah, remember <laughs> that this view will also will help you uh, with the, another protocol. It's called the blue protocol, looking for the lung pathologies. So but we, we save that for another webinar. Thank you. So yeah, now it's my turn. Uh, thank you, Rabe, for this presentation, and thank you, Anna, as well. Um, now we have a patient that is in shock. In shock. It's a 19-year-old patient that comes to the hospital because he is in shock, in stupor, hypertension, and the rash. And we're gonna find out very fast why is he in a, in a shock. Can you move the side? So we have the rush protocol, which is the rapid ultrasound for shock and hypertension. And we start with a, with a patient that has a, a, a low uh, non hypertension, a low ejection fraction, uh, and we're going to have to look for the heart. We're going to have to look for the heart if, we, if the ejection fraction is high or low, uh, if their right ventricle is a, it has a strain or not, so for a pulmonary embolism, if there is a pericardial effusion or not, uh, if there is a high or low cardiac output, we're going to check for the inferior vena cava as well to see if it's collapsible or not for to know what type of shock we're talking about. We'll have to look also with a part that overlaps with the FAST exam that uh, Rabe presented to see if there is bleeding inside. So this is why we're going to watch around the abdomen to see if there, uh, the Paul Morrison or the EFAST exam that complements it, if there is an emperitoneum. Afterward, we're going to check for the aorta and in the end for the uh, for the lungs, for the pulmonary part, to check if there is a pneumothorax. We're not going to cover all of them because this is only a presentation to keep you interested in ultrasound, but we have a little mnemonic for this with a high map. If the patient is low map, we're going to make it high map in order to check if everything is going on correctly and to um, correct all these parts. So what we have in the rush examination, we have uh, several uh, views of the heart, the parasternal long cardiac uh, view. We have the apical fold chamber view, the inferior vena cava, a part that overlaps with the EFS examination. Then we're going to check for the water and a pulmonary view. Can you move the slide? So uh, we have, I have my, myself a little probe because we do not have to talk talk about that, but we, there are always uh, some innovative ways to make ultrasound, and uh, this is a more cheaper alternative, but it is not uh, as qualitative of the, as the bigger and uh, more expensive uh, uh, ultrasound machine, but this is a little uh, butterfly machine that uh, can help us make uh, um, bedside ultrasound, the point of care ultrasound, so this is, uh, I'm going to show it on myself, how do we put the probe? So for the um, parasternal look axis, we're going to have the marker of the probe onto the right shoulder, like in the image next to it. And I'm going to show you my heart to see if I'm still alive. And we're going to evaluate the, um, uh, the heart to see if everything is going OK. So usually you, you can see also the heart here. My heart is moving. This is, I do not have the best of images because I'm doing two stuff at the same time. Uh, so what we're going to see, we're going to have the left ventricle. We're going to have the light, uh, the left ventricle that we're going to see it here. I think I'm going to point it more on the on the screen because it's easier. But you can see that it's something that we can do it very easily as I'm doing it live for you now. So we're going to have the light, left ventricle. We're going to have the left left uh, left atrium. We're going to see how it contracts. In the image in the middle, we have a normal ejection fraction. 
And at the first image that is on the right side, we have a reduced ejection fraction, just to make you have the image that we can evaluate with our eyes. There are more quantitative measures, but we're not going to talk about them because this is only an introduction. Next slide, please. So there is another view that is called the apical four chamber. When you put the probe with the pointer towards the left shoulder, and we're going to put it into uh, uh, the fourth to five intercostal space and more on the medioclavicular line or on the left side. So what do we see here? We see the four chambers of the heart. So we're going to check the right ventricle, the live ventr uh, left ventricle, the right atrium, the left atrium. And we're going to look if there is free fluid and if uh, one of the ventricles is more enlarged and if they are contracting as they should. So now I'm going to have a question for you. I know that uh, I'm checking now that we do not have to interact as, uh, a lot, but you can put uh, your answers into the chat. What do we see on the image on the right? We see a black spot that it's around the heart. And I'm going to let you point uh, the answers into the chat if you want to. But uh, yeah, exactly. It's an echinagic uh, uh, image. So we're going to see fluid around the heart. Exactly. Very well, I see that people are already starting to uh, respond. Next slide, please. So yeah, now we're gonna see another image of the heart. So I'm gonna making you, I'm gonna make you work uh, right now. What does the pointer point to in that image? Come on, let's chat a little bit. You can put some uh, some some text into the chat. So yeah, this is the right ventricle. It's an enlarged right ventricle. It's it it shows the right ventricle strain. So yeah, very well. So we, you 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 can see that with a fast and rapid. Yeah, we think about the the pulmonary embolism. Very good, Mohammed. Very good. Uh, exactly that patient that shows with this enlarged right heart has a pulmonary embolism. Very good. Next slide, please. As I said, we're not going to check only for the heart. We're going to check also for the inferior vena cava to see if there is collapsible or not collapsible in order to see what type of shock do we have. If it's uh, more um, um, like, uh, uh, if it's collapsible, uh, our shock is mostly a distributive shock with uh, the heart that's going on and it's dilated. Um, we have another type. Oh, yeah, exactly. We, Muhammad is right on there to um, check about this all. We're going to go on to the next slide. So now we can also check for the water. I'm not going to give all the details and we're going to keep all the other um, uh, um, questions at the end of the presentation because I'm not having a lot of time. Uh, I'm going to just put a normal presentation of the water. Uh, exactly, Mohamed, you're right on top as always. Uh, then the image that is in the middle shows a normal aorta. How do we see it? In the back of the aorta, we, we see the vertebral body. Again, the probe orientation is like this. It's in the abdomen. And uh, we uh, like whoop, at the abdomen. And on the image on the right, we see an abdominal aortic aneurysm. You see it very enlarged. You see it. You, it's just a spot on diagnosis. Next one. Uh, about the pelvic views, the, this is the part that overlaps with the EFS examination. We're going to check if there is blood somewhere in the body in order to correct that. That can explain the shock. Next slide. And then we also had the lung part that Rabi also uh, magnificently explained in order to see if there is a pneumothorax or not. Exactly, free fluid pelvis uh, in the pelvis. Muhammad is always on top as well, very engaged. Thank you. So yeah, this is, uh, I think this is the last slide. Uh, we want to thank a lot uh, Pocus 101. That's a very cool ult uh, ultrasound uh, uh, website. You can find a lot of images and uh, we have to thank them for, uh, for, uh, for these images. I'm giving- uh, Okay. Magnific magnificent presentation, guys. Thank you so very much. You are our stars, our promises. Very good luck with your project of the ultrasound special interest group in the IFDM organization. Okay, and now we continue with the next theme and the next theme presented by another team. And these another team are Rocio from Madrid, Spain, uh, Nissan, 
Kerala, India, and me, Elena, from Balearic Island, Spain. Uh, we are members of the Wonka Special Interest Group on Emergency Medicine, and uh, we decided to present to you very shortly one small project of ours, we have many of them, and it is the approach to the aggressive patient in the daily practice of family doctors. Uh, now here, Gail, rhetoric questions. How many of you did experience aggression during work in healthcare or as general practitioner during a consultation? Now, how many of you did experience the verbal aggression? And how many of you did report the verbal aggression? Next question, how many of you did experience physical violence? And what about the sexual harassment during the work? Next interesting question, how many of you thought that this is a form of violence, the sexual harassment in the work? And finally, how many of you reported any form of aggression against the health workers? So these are completely rhetoric questions just for us to analyze, but we start uh, from the who definition of the aggression and we speak about the aggressive patient. When we speak about the aggression, it refers to the behavior that is intended to harm another individual, and it can be emotional or impulsive or not intended or instrumental or cognitive, which is planned and intentional. But then there is another point of view and then there is another aspect. We are speaking not about the physical violence, if not just about a difficult patient in the consultation. And the difficult patient is defined as the one who provokes strong negative emotions in their physicians. So why, it is, why is it so important for us to know how to manage this kind of difficult patients? First of all, because if we have them in our consultation, we start making a defensive medicine we start making the prescriptions for unjustified treatments or unnecessary diagnostic tests. If we have difficult patient in our consultation, we're not comfortable working and really, there is something quite relating to the burnout. We don't want to go to work to feel us so unpleasantly bad there. We are afraid in many occasions to get complaints or negative publicity or negative reports, which can influence uh, the money effect in our consultation or just can be quite bad image for our reputation. And so finally, we decide to have peace than to be right. So there are two types of factors that influence when classifying the patient as difficult. And one of those are derived from the characteristics of the patient himself. But there is the other group and they are derived from the feelings or emotions that the patient generates in us as professionals. So there are three types of uh, those reasons that make the patient-doctor relationship difficult. One of them are in the patient himself. The pathology that the patient can present that it can be complicated for us. The patient's personality or the circumstances in which the patient develops. It can be a frequent in our consultation, and many times we are speaking about elderly people who perceive the visit to the primary care consultation as a social life, and they come there to speak with their neighbors, friends, to speak about their net use, to speak about their pains and their diseases, and to speak to you. And they wait that you listen with all attention, everything, what they want to tell you about their life. So there can be another type of people and they are just bad character or histrionic characters or demanding people or bad mannered patients with whom it is very complicated to reach to an understanding. Or there can be just a language barrier. So these will make you, the relationship with the patient complicated. There is, another side of this coin and there are reasons that depends on us as professionals. It can be our own personality, our own character. 
There can be our own health disorders and our personal family problems. We can have multiple jobs that lead us to express during the consultation haste. We can have our complicated character, difficult to deal sometimes with the people, and we can have our personal communication barriers. And there is the third side of this uh, multi-side coin, and this is the environment, something that doesn't depend on nobody of us, not on the patients and not on the professionals, just the inappropriate reception, organization, and the circuits of the user attention. So the patient is unsatisfied and many occasions that this unsatisfaction has lots of reasons. So the patient can suffer because uh, of the excessive waiting times for the consultations of the uh, specialists. Or during the cons consultation, he feels frequent interruptions uh, or um, feels that the doctor has lots of paperwork, which is unable to manage. There are some social problems with our patients which are difficult to resolve and really don't depend on us. But because of that, we are family physicians and we are supposed to treat not only body, but also the soul and the brain. So all these problems come to us and to our consultation. Rocio, could you please uh, explain us this matter? Yeah, I'm going to speak about the psychological declaration of violence. So, this, you know, the first thing we have to, to understand is that it's not the same frustration and intimidation. A patient which is frustrated uh, is naughty, is not under control, and uh, you are feeling uh, angry, also irritated, and you have some empathy with your with your patients, uh, but you feel almost uh, the, the most of the time angry. And the intervention that we have to do in these situations when our patients are frustrated is empath empathizing, understanding what's happening to the patients, what's uh, the problem with them, and why are, are they are so so angry. We are we have also to understand what's intimidation. The patient when is trying to intimidate you is focused uh, and is in control. He knows what he wants to do. It makes you feel scared and angry, and you can't empathize with it, with him or with her. And um, the intervention should uh, would be in, in these occasions boundaries. Also, if you don't understand exactly if they're frustrated or intimidated, the second one is the one you should do. Please, continue. Yeah. What happens if you can't? Uh, find this empathy that we are asking you to find. Um, why is this patient in my allergy zone? I should ask to me um, to try to uh, to understand. I I have to do this, this kind of questions. What does this say about my best core quality? Uh, what are my weakness and the challenges into this? So in these cases, uh, if I am ambitious, um, too much of these ambitions may, would be make me be impatient. Uh, which is we shouldn't be the best way. We should change to the opposite one. We should, with, which is patience. We have to be patient, and we have to be um, ambitious because too much patience is not good neither. Because we go to passivity, and the opposite of passivity is ambitious. So we should stay in these two: ambitious and patient. Okay, I follow, Rosie. Okay. Good. Okay, so uh, from these points, there are several situations to be avoided. Thank you very much. Um, the situations to be avoided is uh, are to overlook the situation. And to overlook the situation can be because of that we downplay the situation or because we ignore the patient's feeling because we really don't consider this feeling to be justified. And then there is one very important thing to be avoided. We must never blame the patient for provoking unpleasant feelings in us. So here, there are some recommendations to improve the relationships with our patients in these complicated situations. First of them is always be respectful. Uh, avoid using first names. In Spanish, we call it tuteo. 
even if there is cordiality and tenderness and understanding in their relation in our relationship but please keep everybody in his place keep a distance be very careful with the nonverbal communication since a gesture that we make can be distorted by the patient and the relatives and it can create very serious unnecessary situations and we can even fail in our therapeutic intervention another recommendation is kindness and affection it is free to smile it is easy to smile so try to present the smile to your patient and then Another very wise suggestion. The family plays a fundamental role in the communication, since it can be a great ally of ours. So always be ready to give as many explanations as are necessary and requested to position the family on our side. The empathic management of security. It is very important that we don't get in tune with the aggressiveness. And the objective is to avoid escalating the situation with our own emotional response. We need to practice the active listening and to show empathy and understanding, even if we disagree with the viewpoint of the patient. Nonverbal cues should convey to the patient a sense of calm and non-aggression. Transmit with your body and with your face these good feelings. Explain your position to the patient and be firm, setting boundaries. And let the angry patient speak as the aggressiveness will go away by itself if you do this. Often it is enough for the aggressive patient just to feel that you sincerely want to help him and so to become one of our most loyal patients. Here we have quite a terrifying video. This video comes from Russia. Um, the text, the voice is completely distorted. It is impossible to understand nothing what they are speaking, but we want you to see uh, one minute of the video to continue speaking about the measures of protection and our safety in the consultation. Here we go. Okay, horrifying images, as I told you, without text, without the possibility to understand what they're speaking about, but the images speak by themselves. Please, Rothi, explain us this secure office setup. Yes, Elena. Well, uh, I want to um, to explain uh, one ways to make your office uh, more uh, sure and effective in case that someone wants to... Uh, Unmute yourself another time, Rocio, please. Excuse me, excuse me, sorry. Yes, um, I want to explain or to give you some pieces of advice uh, of, of how you should think about your office in, in order to make it sure and um, in case someone is going to be aggressive and wants to make something bad to you. So imagine that you have one door in your office um, and you, you should think where to put the desk in order that you escape the more efficient way. In this case, if you have the desk in the middle of the, um, of the room, 
the patient is closer to the door, so you won't be able to escape. Continue, please, Elena. The patient will lock you, will be a, a, in the middle in the middle way between you and the door, so you won't escape. In this case, I suggest you to put the desk in the middle of the door. You have more space back, to back but who cares? The first thing you have to think about is about all your your own security, and in this in this case, you have the door very close, and you could escape in case you need to. The thing is easier if you have two doors, please. Well, in this case, of course, uh, if you have the door in the other part of the room, uh, it will it will be impossible to to escape. I suggest you to do it this way, putting as before the desk in the middle. So you are closer, but as I was saying, uh, this is easier if you have two doors. Many many offices have two doors. In Spain, it's very common. I don't know in other countries. Please, Elena. So in this case, it's really obvious. If you have a door back back to you, you just run. But sometimes you you never thought about you have two doors and though they both doors are close to the patients and you don't have a way to go out so the patient will will be closer to those doors and you will you won't escape so in this case you put the desk closer to both doors and if you can have one only for you it would be the best in that case you will escape easily and okay that's all thank you thank you rosy very much nissan's yeah hi so i i would just uh, like to to highlight a few cases from the international scenario basically two case studies from india uh, the one which you see on the left side of the screen uh, that happened somewhere in the northeast of india uh, uh, where a 73 74 year old uh, doctor a senior doctor was uh, um beaten to death uh, as you can see in the image uh, he was surrounded by a mob of uh, patient uh, relatives or bystanders uh, or attenders, as you call it in your country. Uh, we call them as bystanders here. Uh, so as many as 30 of them barged inside a room. So I'm just um, uh, taking back your attention to what Rocio just uh, mentioned about a single room a clinic of a doctor where he was seated inside uh, the desk was inside and uh, the doctor was seated opposite to the door. As you can see, the door is on the, the left side of the screen and uh, almost uh, 30 uh, relatives barged in and uh, manhandled the doctor and he was beaten to death. <clears throat> then uh, another case scenario, which uh, we recently had uh, another tragic one was of a young doctor in my own state, the southernmost uh, part of India, that is Kerala. And uh, she was a young doctor, a 24-year-old doctor who was uh, getting trained uh, to, to practice as a doctor. And uh, uh, that was an, an, another unfortunate uh, uh, event where a, a prisoner was brought uh, without handcuffs by um, uh, the, the police. And uh, the prisoner was uh, in, in a mood uh, to attack uh, people. And uh, the rest of the hospital staff and doctors, they ran inside uh, their rooms. Whereas uh, this uh, young doctor who didn't have any idea uh, of uh, what was to be done was uh, uh, alone with uh, this prisoner in, in a hall. So uh, that was again uh, a place where uh, she was uh, uh, to confront with the prisoner who stabbed her to death with uh, whatever uh, was available in, in uh, the, the corridor. So those two are uh, like a reminder that you should have an escape route in place and also not to, to confront uh, any uh, patient or uh, their relatives whenever they um, are in a mood to, to attack or manhandle you. Um, can I just move on to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, we'll also be covering about uh, the pharmacological restraints. Uh, uh, an easier uh, thing that uh, we usually do in ED is a pharmacological restraint, but uh, um, there are uh, certain norms in specific countries. Uh, like uh, in India, we have uh, uh, the, the patients are, are not to be uh, restrained uh, manually. 
uh, without their consent. But uh, uh, when you have uh, patients who are coming uh, as aggressive patients because of intoxication, uh, you have to have some manual restraints uh, with uh, the help of some uh, scarf or some something to tie up their hands or uh, feet if possible. But if that is not possible, we go for pharmacological restraints. And uh, the, the one shown in this picture is a na nasal atomizer device or uh, the mucosal atomizer device, uh, as you call it. It's it's not that uh, much of use in, in, in my country. So I'm not uh, very much uh, using this other than for pediatric anesthesia. But uh, I, I gather that uh, this is a fairly simple to use and uh, an easier uh, thing to be used uh, for patients who are agitated. And the drugs which are commonly used are uh, the benzodiazepines, uh, in which uh, midazolam is a short-acting and uh, a sweeter drug uh, compared to long-acting um, things like uh, diazepam and lorazepam. Then uh, you could use ketamine, for, especially for pediatric uh, patients. Uh, then haloperidol, fentanyl, glucagon. Uh, these are the usual drugs, but uh, from, from an Indian perspective, uh, a, a few other common drugs which we use are uh, something like uh, pendazosin, which is an opioid or a narcotic, and uh, promethazine, which are given in combination as a uh, high dose uh, uh, sometimes. Then something like a coma cocktail, which we use uh, in ED for comatose patients, but we could also uh, try using for patients who are uh, agitated because they could be uh, uh, because of hypoglycemia. So a dextrose would be a good addition. Then uh, they might be under influence of alcohol. So again, dextrose and thiamine could be uh, used. Then flumazenil, if you consider the patient to be uh, in a post-ictal state after seizures due to various reasons, you never know. So flumazenil and uh, naloxone. So uh, these are probably the pharmacological approach to patients who present uh, as agitated patients in the ED. Yeah, uh, so over to you, Alina. Uh, thank you very much, Nissan. And it is just one very important recommendation for us as family doctors is to be attentive to that moment when we need to distinguish, when the patient stops being a patient and becomes an aggressor. It is so complicated for us because we are family doctors. We are the people who accompany patients and their families during all their life and to catch this moment and to change our attitude from the receiving a patient to meeting an aggressor is complicated. Well, so here is the end of our presentation and there are 10 very helpful tips for dealing with an angry patient from a professional point of view, evidently. So first of them, stay calm, speak calmly and respectfully. Avoid escalating the situation with your own emotional response. Learn how to do it. Second, don't take nothing personally. Never, practically never, nothing of the aggression is personal towards you. Third, listen to the concerns of the patients. Find a way to connect with the patient and look for support from the family members. Show empathy and understanding. Smile. And show understanding even if you disagree with the viewpoint of the patient. Be firm setting boundaries when the patient becomes aggressive. Firmly and assertively communicate boundaries and expectations and learn how to address the concerns of the patient proposing their honest and realistic solutions. Never lie. Ensure your personal safety. Rocio and Nissan spoke to you about this. Keep in mind how to protect yourself from a combative patient. And the last suggestion, please don't doubt to seek assistance if it is necessary. If the situation is complicated, just look for help. So this is our part. Thank you very much, Rocio and Nissan. And we pass to the last part of our webinar and it will be dedicated to the emergencies which we normally attend in primary care. 
which is very common very often in our practice. So I give the floor to Miriam, hoping that she is able to connect correctly, that she's on trip right now. So Miriam, stage is yours. Thank you very much, Elena. Amazing presentation for now on for the... Uh, I would like to talk about anaphylaxis because it's something that we can face everywhere, a pre-hospitalary setting, uh, hospitalary setting, but for us, primary care doctors, we have to know how to manage. So please uh, pass the, the slide, please. Uh, as you can know, so many countries have different guidelines, have different uh, approach, but as a review, different continental ones from the UK to Australia, to America, and to even the European ones, the basic approach and the treatment is the same in all the guidelines. The first, a little bit in the, not in the basics, but in the next part. So we can review a little bit of them and I will use the, the European, the, sorry, the resuscitation cards in the UK because for me, they seems like the more visual appealing for us. What it is anaphylaxia, the anaphylaxis is the word allergy. The organization said this is a serious systematic hypersensitivity reaction that is usually rapid in onset and might cause death. So it's a current potentially life threatening, compromising airway, breathing, and or circulation. You can be affected one or the three parts. So uh, of course, you can see that the most events, of course, as food uh, uh, anaphylaxis, drugs anaphylaxis, or even insects. Uh, what's, uh, please, the next one, please. Thank you. You have to be careful because most of the time we think of anaphylaxis on rash, uh, flushing, urticaria, and geodema, but this is maybe in the 20% of the process is not going to happen. So you have the different ones, uh, the, the poster presentation for you to understand that the differences are minimal, but I choose the, the Council UK. Please, uh, you can slide for me to explain the situation because it's really, really uh, visual appealing. You, we can change the light, please. Okay, as you can see, it's really easy, but you can have to search for to search for diagnosis. Usually, there are skin change, but not 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 uh, all the time. And airway, breathing, or circulation is a feeling. Airway, we talk about throat and talk swelling, hoarse voice, a street, or is a high pitch inspiratory noise. For breathing, we talk about the increase of work, uh, bronchospasm, patient become tired, they have fatigue, they, they have hypoxemia, uh, the saturation is low at 24, and maybe they have central cyanosis, respiratory arrest. We're talking about circulatory where there are things of shock, better pole, clemmy, tachycardia, dizziness, arrhythmia, or maybe cardiac arrest. What do we have to do if they're in earlier stage? We call for help. Remove the, tri the trigger if it's possible. I mean, drugs, you can put it off, stop an infusion, let the patient flat, or let them sit down. Don't stand up with the patient if it's pregnant, left on the side, and give intramuscular adrenaline. Half on the, of the ampoule, the ampoule is one milliliter, one milligram uh, adrenaline. You can put half on, of it. And of course, uh, flow decision and give another adrenaline in the next five minutes if it's necessary. What's more, fluids, you can have to give fluids. You have to give at least for 500 milliliters to one liter for adults and 10 milli milligrams per kilo, uh, one mil 10 milliliters per kilo per child. One more idea you ha we have to understand that we have to, uh, if it's not responding to fluids, to adrenaline, even two doses, we have to for, uh, we have to think on refractory anaphylaxis. We have to think send them to the hospital, and we have in the hospital setting we send an infusion of adrenaline. But that is not for primary care. That is for the hospital systems. Uh, next, please. Some review for you to understand that maybe if the airway is affected and use some inhalers, inhalers in nebulization or a spacer. If you don't have a nebulization, but you have a spacer, you can do it. You can use ipratropy, you can use salbuterol, you can use uh, sal salbutamol, and you can use it, uh, different types. Uh, about uh, steroids, they say in the guidelines, they say not 
in the first part of the treatment. Maybe there's a refractory, a refractory anaphylaxis before. You have you can use prednisolone oral or hydrocortisone in the in the venous. And go, uh, what about antihistaminic? The same. Don't wait to put adrenaline for putting anti antihistaminic. You have to put the adrenaline first and then the antihistaminics. And maybe one they don't, don't generate dizziness because then you can lose focus and the and there's not complicated shock or there's no complicated breathing problem. Is that uh, that uh, antihistaminic working? Next, please. As we can talk about, the, uh, we repeat the dose. We have to put the intramuscular adrenaline, 0 0.5 milli milliliters in the in the ties. Okay, in the ties, all the time you have to put it intramuscular. For the people, if they are recovering, uh, it differs. The guys like here differs from the European to the Australian to the American ones. The most uh, laid down guideline is the American would say, if you only need one dose and the patient is asymptomatic, they go uh, home in one hour of observation. The other one, they say at least two hours and the Australian why they say, okay, four hours, maybe it's more, it's, it's, uh, it's better. If they did need two doses of intramuscular or they have a biphasic reaction or refractory anaphylaxis before, they have to six hours, most of the guidelines, as a Europeans one that they say at least 12 hours of observation. And they, if they have hypotension during the process, 12 to 24 hours. And of course, if you need more than two doses of adrenaline, they have a severe asthma severe allergies is night to shift in a place that uh, has difficult to access the medical environment, please let them uh, stay until the morning, okay? And go home with an auto injector of epinephrine, a specialist referral, education and information. And you have all the info in the slides. Thank you very much. And then uh, Roshan will speak to you about uh, ear pathology. Thank you very much, Dali. Oh, thank you. Now we're going to have another session on ear pathology in the emergency department. Uh, this is one of the common presentations that we see in the emergency department. And basically, uh, I presented here over the three basic, basic variants. They are the otitis externa, acute otitis media, and ear foreign body. Uh, this otitis externa is of clinical diagnosis and it can be a localized uh, DJ, localized pattern like coronculitis to the diffuse otitis externa that extends from uh, pinna to whole of the external auditory canal. Uh, so in this case, the treatment mainly is the analgesics like acetaminophen or a combination of acetaminophen and the ibuprofen. Uh, use of the topical antibiotics uh, has also shown benefits in these cases. Um, but for the uncomplicated one, but in those cases uh, who have uh, diabetes who are in the immunocompromised state, uh, tropical antibiotics as well as systemic antibiotics is preferred over uh, is preferred because it will shorten the durations of the illness. Uh, this use of the topical corticosteroids it also provides the soothing effects, and the use of these external auditory canal packing is frequently done for this. And we can use the compounds like hydrocellulose, uh, we can use the glycerol in our part. And we often use the pack make of that uh, ribbon coat that mixed with these topical corticosteroid and topical antibiotics combinations uh, formula. And we put that pack into the external auditory canal um, and remove, uh, reassess that uh, patient after two days, uh, maximum of 48 hours. Uh, uh, for the air pack and uh, by doing this we can dispose these cases from our emergency department and we can follow up in the OPD basis. Next please. Uh, another one is this uh, uh, acute otitis media. Uh, this acute, acute otitis media is mainly of clinical diagnosis also uh, because in clinically what we have is uh, like uh, air pain which can be unilateral or bilateral followed by minimum amount of discharge uh, an examination the tympanic membrane looks of fiery uh, red presentations like that and when we do the pneumatic otoscopy uh, there will be no movement of this tympanic membrane we really we rarely do this uh, pneumatic otoscopy in uh, emergency department uh, over here and uh, uh, 
minimum amount of discharge can be there in case of this acute otitis media also. Uh, main treatment, the main treatment for this is analgesic, systemic analgesics like acetaminophen and a combination of these with ibuprofen. And next is the antibiotics. Antibiotics, systemic antibiotics is preferred uh, for uh, this acute otitis media than the topical one uh, because it can land up in the complications like perforation of tympanic membrane and mastoiditis. Uh, while going for this treatment, uh, most uh, we also practice this safety net prescription strategy uh, where we give these medications for uh, only a short uh, duration of the time and just uh, let it go. And again, we uh, provide these antibiotics for the next types. Uh, and the choice of the antibiotics also differ over here. For example, the first drug of choice here is the amoxicillin with clavulinic acid or the amoxicillin group. And the second drugs of choice for these are the cephalosporin, uh, that third generation cephalosporins we prefer over the year. Uh, for the, uh, this case, once managed uh, in emergency department, can be discharged and need to follow up in two to three days. We need to assess for the pain uh, and look for these complications development over here. Next, please. Uh, this ear foreign body is another uh, uh, commonly seen uh, presentations in the emergency department. Uh, the diagnosis is again clinical presentative history of something uh, entering into the ear. It can be any living as a living body or it can be a non-living body. Uh, it differs uh, and the treatment is removal. This removal of this foreign body can be done. Uh, uh, it must be done under the direct visualization. Uh, uh, but we have different techniques to remove this foreign body and the basic use of these concepts and the instrument depends upon the type of the foreign body. Uh, we can use the probe methods where, you, we can, where we can use GS probe, rubber catheter suction methods and the syringing methods. But there are a few things that we need to consider during this, like uh, if there are some spherical agents, yeah, uh, then spherical bodies like balls, uh, steel balls, so we should avoid the use of these uh, forceps, you know. Uh, these are the things that need to be considered. And when removing these live insects, we need to immobilize them first and uh, do go for the syringing. Immobilization can be done by use of these uh, whale or olive oil or aqua drops followed by the syringing. Uh, but uh, while doing syringing also, what we need to uh, consider is either that foreign body has made any injury to the tympanic membrane or not. Uh, if the tympanic membrane has been perforated by that live uh, insects, then we should avoid the syringing. We can go for the suction evacuations uh, in this case also, and if force is formed, suction evacuation can be done. Uh, next, please. Now, this use of this uh, instrument basically depends upon the types of the foreign bodies. For example, if these foreign bodies are easily grabsable, like piece of paper, cotton, or foam, we can use these allocated forceps. Uh, we can use the suction tip uh, foreign bodies, uh, suction tip instrument for removal of these uh, non grabsable uh, foreign bodies, which are round and smooth like a bead. And these wire loop uh, instruments can be used for the removal of these uh, types of the foreign bodies like beads. And irrigation syringing can be done for the removals of foreign bodies uh, like uh, live insects uh, and these uh, uh, small beads also. Uh, it can be used for that. Next, please. Now, oh, this is the video that's showing one live insect in a uh, external auditory canal near this tympanic membrane. And we have uh, removed this foreign body using the techniques of syringe, which was done in our emergency department. Okay, I stop this one and pass to the yes. next one. Yeah. Okay. If I if I'm able. Yeah. So this is the syringe technique. Fantastic, yes, and the you. life of the patient is saved. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> and insect too. And insect too. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Roshan. And now we have our last 
and for sure not least presenter. And it is Miriam from Bolivia. Miriam will speak in Spanish and we will uh, ask our interpreter to English to translate her text to you uh, to English. Thank you very much, Komal, for your help. And thank you very much, Miriam. The stage is yours. Eh, muy buenas, buenos días a todos. Eh, mi nombre es Miriam eh, Lourdes Vizcamaraza. Soy residente de, de segundo año en medicina familiar. Eh, me informo en lo que es el, el Hospital Obrero de la Caja Nacional de Salud en, en Potosí, Bolivia. Bueno, hoy voy a tocar el tema de, de desadaptación aguda de la altura. Eh, yo actualmente me encuentro, bueno, en la ciudad de Potosí me encuentro a 4.070 metros sobre el nivel del mar. Entonces, muchas personas que vienen aquí a hacer turismo, de, que vienen de, de diferentes países, entonces existen o pasan por este proceso ¿no? de la desadaptación aguda a la altura, que les voy a ir explicando en qué consiste. Bueno, dentro de las patologías eh, propias de la altura, tenemos estas cuatro, y la que vamos a tocar esta, esta mañana es la desadaptación aguda a la altura, eh, denominada mal de altura o también soroche. Eh, dentro de las otras más severas son el edema agudo pulmonar de la altura, el edema cerebral de la altura y una adaptación crónica a la altura, que sería la polisitemia o eritrocitis propia de la altura. La siguiente. Bueno, podemos indicar que bueno, la, 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 la desadaptación aguda de la altura va a depender mucho del ascenso, de la velocidad de ascenso que se tenga a, por encima de 2.000 metros sobre el nivel del mar eh, y también va a variar, va a ir en relación con la edad y el tiempo de aclimatación que la persona tenga. Podemos mencionar que el 25% de las personas que ascienden a partir de 2.000 metros sobre el nivel del mar tienden a presentar signos sintomatología de desadaptación aguda de la altura. Y un tanto del 53% de personas que vayan ascendiendo presentan eh, los signos y síntomas a partir de 4.000 metros sobre el nivel del mar. Eh, bueno, una relación o un parámetro variable entre, entre manifestaciones de entre signos y síntomas se presentan a, a, en algunos individuos entre 1.800 metros sobre el nivel del mar y 3.500 metros sobre el nivel del mar. La instalación de lo que es la desadaptación aguda a la altura se puede presentar en minutos a horas y el tiempo de evolución entre la adaptación eh, se produce entre 3 a 4 días presentando los síntomas eh, de mayor, en mayor intensidad en lo que es en, durante la noche y durante la mañana. Bueno, dentro de lo que es la fisiopatología de la desadaptación a la, a la aguda a la altura. Entre lo que es la fisiopatología aguda de la altura, es importante hablar de dos situaciones ¿no? que forman parte de esto. Uno que es la hipoxemia. Eh, la hipoxemia es la disminución parcial de oxígeno que va en relación a la disminución de la presión barométrica y esta que está dada por la dis disminución de la, del peso de la de columna de aire que se va que va disminuyendo en relación a, que, a, a medida que va ascendiendo eh, eh, arriba de 2.000 metros sobre el nivel del mar. Y también eh, es importante, bueno, la, la que nos causa el problema de desadaptación aguda a la altura es la hipoxia aguda. Eh, la hipoxia aguda está dada por la hipoxemia. Eh, que a nivel de nuestro organismo, esta está captada, eh, bueno, como hay una disminución de oxígeno, eh, disminución de parcial de oxígeno, nuestro cuerpo a nivel sanguíneo existe también una disminución de captación de oxígeno o transporte de oxígeno, y esta es captada por los centros reguladores o químicos receptores a nivel de la carótida y a nivel de la aorta, que estos envían señales eh, que se activan cuando existe una presión menor a 70 milímetros de mercurio. Y esto activa, se activa a nivel del centro respiratorio vulvar, que hace que aumente la frecuencia y la profundidad de la respiración, de la respiración y aumente lo que es el volumen eh, minuto respiratorio, generando una eliminación de dióxido de carbono que hace que exista un aumento de pH 
eh, de pH, causando una alcalosis respiratoria y esto bloquea lo que es la, los receptores carotidios y el receptor, lo, los, receptor, los quimioreceptores a nivel de la aorta y a nivel del centro respiratorio vulvar, generando, bueno, disminuyendo lo que es la frecuencia respiratoria. Pero como sabemos que existe una disminución de la captación de oxígeno, entonces eh, esto se vuelve a repetir, ¿no? es un ciclo constante. Eh, nosotros dentro del mecanismo fisiopatológico de que tenemos en nuestro organismo, en lo que es eh, cuando se produce una alcalosis respiratoria, tenemos mecanismos compensatorios eh, que hacen que nuestro organismo elimine bicarbonato a nivel renal, que hace que se regule la, el pH a nivel sanguíneo. ¿no? Bueno. Eh, Bueno, dentro de lo que es los signos y síntomas de lo que es la desadaptación aguda a la altura, los síntomas más frecuentes son la cefalea, alteraciones del sueño, eh, vértigos, mareos, eh, síntomas digestivos, eh, náuseas, ¿verdad? Uh, y cuando es mucho más, eh, más agudo, existen alteraciones mentales, ataxia y demás periféricos, pero ya hablamos de esto, estos puntos en relación a lo que es el edema agudo eh, de pulmón y el edema cerebral. Bueno, nosotros nos basamos en lo que es la escala de, de la GLOWS, que clasifica al mal, a la desadaptación aguda de la altura al mal de montaña como leve de 1 a 3 puntos, moderado de 4 a 6 puntos y grave mayor a 7 puntos. Bueno. Yeah. Continuando, eh, el, dentro de lo que es el tratamiento que nosotros podemos ofrecer en atención primaria, eh, cuando hablamos de una desadaptación aguda leve, eh, se puede administrar lo que es el paracetamol, el ibuprofeno, el paracetamol a un gramo vía oral cada seis horas, ibuprofeno 400 miligramos vía oral cada ocho horas, eh, ibuprofeno de, de nimenhidrato para los mareos y el vértigo entre 5 a 100 miligramos vía oral cada cuatro a seis horas, cuando son cuadros leves. Eh, y cuando hablamos de un, un cuadro moderado a grave, se puede administrar o añadir al tratamiento lo que es la acetosolamida, que nos ayuda en lo que es la, el equilibrio de la alcalosis que se, respiratoria que se va produciendo a nivel de nuestro organismo, esta coayuva eliminando lo que es el bicarbonato y hace que sea, eh, bueno, la desadaptación se vaya bueno, los síntomas y signos vayan remitiendo. Eh, por lo general, el tratamiento se puede hacer de 125 a 250 miligramos vía oral cada 12 horas en dosis de prevención y 250 miligramos vía oral cada 8 horas a 12 horas en dosis de tratamiento. Eh, también se puede llegar a administrar como un antiinflamatorio de hidronatosol, la dexametasona, eh, 2 miligramos vía oral cada 6 horas, dosis de prevención, 4 miligramos vía oral cada 12 horas en dosis de prevención o en su caso, 4 miligramos EB o intramuscular cada 6 horas en dosis de tratamiento, en dosis de tratamiento. Pero esto por lo general ya se va administrando en caso de edema agudo de pulmón o en caso de en ese eh, Bueno, la siguiente. Bueno, eh, podemos indicar dentro de las medidas generales que nosotros podemos recomendar a las personas que vengan a visitarnos es uno, tener un ascenso lento, evitar ejercicios extenuantes, evitar la ingesta de bebidas alcohólicas, mantener una hidratación, que es lo más importante, eh, y también eh, la prevención farmacológica se la puede realizar ya cuando se empiezan a presentar síntomas, cuando van ascendiendo a partir de los 3.000 metros sobre el nivel del mar, eh, y un ascenso rápido en 24 horas. Es importante hacer un ascenso paulatino eh, de 300 metros a partir de los, de los, de los, de los 3.000 metros, hacer un, un descanso, 300 metros hoy, descansar esta noche y volver a ascender 300 metros después.
Sí, y bueno, las personas que tengan patologías cardiológicas y aún así quieren ascender, es importante poder contar con oxígeno para poder ayudarles, para poder apoyarles esto por encima de los 2.000 metros sobre el nivel del mar. Bueno, eh, este es el tema eh, en cuanto he querido presentar y bueno, agradecerles y un saludo cordial y un abrazo fraterno desde la ciudad de Potosí a 4.070 metros sobre el nivel del mar. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lots of hugs to these uh, height of 4,000 meters over the level of the sea. So, guys, our webinar is coming to the end. Uh, before um, Stuart uh, give you the last words uh, and last thanks. And so I would like you to point our contact numbers, our contact email directions. Here on the left, you have uh, uh, the email of the team of the ultrasound of the young doctors, though it is the European movement of young family doctors. Still, uh, in Wonka world, uh, we have the ultrasound special interest group where you can join if you are not the European citizen. Uh, and here to the right, you have the emergency medicine special interest group from Wonka, and uh, you will be more than welcome to join our group, to participate in our projects, in our amazing workshops, which we are giving in the Wonka Congresses all around the planet. Uh, so very welcome will be. We will try to answer some questions because I see here some raised hands and I give the floor to Stuart. Thank you so very much. Thanks, Lena. Lena, so do you want us to take the Q&A now or are we wrapping up? Uh, whatever you consider. So we have a couple of minutes, so we can have a, one or two questions. Uh, Mohammed, your hand was raised first. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I express my gratitude for the wonderful session today and uh, the great uh, platform uh, for the family medicine and raising the concerns of family medicine on this call and the wonderful uh, presenters and amazing talk uh, today. My first question uh, regarding the resuscitation, what should be our protocol uh, when we resuscitate the patient with the anaphylaxis? Uh, should we remove the uh, trigger uh, first, then call uh, for the help and resuscitate uh, simultaneously? I need to repeat the question, or Stuart, you can help me to understand better a question, please. Mohammed, I didn't catch it either. Could you repeat the question again? Oh, you write us okay. in the chat just one phrase so that we resume your question and give you a good answer. Regarding the treatment of anaphylaxis, I want yes. to ask one thing that removal of the trigger effect, triggering agent that leads to the anaphylaxis. Okay, yes. This is a question for Miriam. Just give us a second. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. So you're here. I'm very, very happy. Thank you. So for you, the triggers. Yeah, that that remove the trigger. Yeah, the triggers. Uh, we can. You have in the slide. But you can receive later. But most of the time, for children, the triggers will be uh, food related. Usually, is milk, nuts, and depends on the country you were born. Uh, some some countries like Spain or Italy has a, a high percentage of peach. Uh, allergies and some other countries wet or celery in, uh, in, during that. But for children, it's uh, it's usual. For adults, would be uh, drugs. Usually, elderly are uh, adults anaphylaxis, and we are talking about hospital settings or pre hospital settings. The trigger with shoot drugs administration. So, if something happens when a drug is going on, you have to stop it the administration of the drug or, inf uh, or infusion. So uh, when you remove the trigger, you start another another endovenous uh, treatment uh, and you start the adrenaline at the same time. Fluids, adrenaline, that is the, the basic protocol. Then if it's a refractory and the, maybe the drugs you're putting on, there are uh, a long life uh, process, 
then you have to administrate other treatments and uh, maintain the patient in observation. But this is for usually for hospital settings. We talk about contrast. We, we talk about other uh, other type of uh, of drugs. And then uh, we have the last part. Usually, this the the insect biting that is depends on this uh, up to six point four five percent of death for insect biting in the in the UK. So uh, you have to be very careful with the wind and set bites because some of them you can uh, have to remove the sting, but others don't have a sting to remove. So you have to check. I think I, I answered the question. If not, uh, we can, I could search on some hear more information. Thank you. Thank you for your detailed uh, discussion on this topic. I want to ask one more question from the Dr. Dragos Paul Hikyo. Uh, regarding the EM course uh, in the fast uh, ultrasound course um, in the trauma phase or in the rush protocol, uh, I extend my uh, we 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 the team of the doctor from Pakistan named as London Global Emergency Medicine Program. We have launched a program named as London Global Emergency Program which is uh, led by UK NHS acute physician consultants, and they are doing the emergency ultrasound uh, courses, workshops, and on practice workshops here in Pakistan. If we do and uh, we join the hand with them, we can spread the most positive word here in Pakistan regarding the family medicine. So it is a great help for us. If you help us, the Bronca help uh, with the joint venture with the London Global Emergency Medicine, led by Dr. Ashwa Kemal Suratia. So it will be a great help for Pakistani because we should follow the guidelines. And the guidelines by the Wonka and the guidelines by the UK Research Council and regarding the... So any any suggestion regarding my uh, reservation? Ultrasound team. Uh, Dragos, Anna. Anna left. I know that she was busy. Dragos Ravi, uh, can you give a short answer, please, to Mohammed? Uh, yeah, I, I think for us it's a, it's a pleasure to collaborate with with you. Uh, you we can uh, try to to contact with the, if you send us an email and we we can try to to arrange uh, either a meeting or or just to to talk about this. So for us it's a pleasure for sure. Thank you. Well, thank you lovely. so much. Thank you, you so really much for this opportunity. Uh, uh, Dr. Maud Parry, last question, and then we'll finish. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, my name is Dr. Parry. I'm one of the emergency medicine specialists in University Hospital of Morecambe in UK. Uh, so uh, I would just like to add a suggestion rather than a question, because uh, one of the... Uh, lectures about ABD, acute behavioral disturbance, I, it was suggested that there's some, something called coma cocktail, which I believe is not evidence-based. Yeah, it, it used to be there decades back, but I don't think we should encourage the use of either any of the components of coma cocktail currently. It's not evidence-based at all. And giving fulmonazil is... A catastrophe. I mean, there are very limited indications why you need to use a filomenazil. You won't use it, uh, I mean, routinely. Uh, that's it. I don't want, I don't have any questions. Just just a recommendation. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Maud. Do you have a comment on that, Eleanor? Yeah, thank you very, very much, Maud, for your commentary. I don't know if Nisant is with us and he would like to answer here, but I can, I can do it also. Because here in Spain and uh, in the place where I live, I live in Ibiza, Ibiza Island. I think many of you know quite well, it is quite famous by its electronic music concerts. And so we have lots of aggressive patients or patients with uh, alteration of behavior um, owing to drugs or alcohol intoxications going beyond of the psychiatric disease uh, or just the bad character and bad manners of the patient. So um, this is true that flumacenil is very, very poorly used uh, 
um, basically in the intoxications and not in the aggressive patient, if not in the unconscious patient, whom you are trying to um, save the life from the cardiac arrest or from deep coma while intoxicated with some opioids, for example. Um, but when we're speaking about cocktail, in Spain, we really don't use it. I don't know exactly even the composition of these kind of cocktails. I know that they are used in some countries, but not in Europe, actually. So I quite agree with you um, in this concept. Yes, we do use uh, benzodiazepines a lot. We use midazolam a lot. Uh, we use sometimes ketamine, uh, but it is not so very extensive because ketamine, you know, um, alterates the conscious of the patient. It is uh, um, the medication which is used to provoke hallucinations. So uh, it is not exactly the medication which we normally use in these kind of patients. And if it is really necessary to use the ketamine because the patient is asthmatic or whatever, and there is a pain component in the aggressive behavior of the patient, in the majority of the occasions, we combine it with midazolam or propofol or some kind uh, of by, um, uh, opioids or benzodiazepines so to control this secondary effect of the ketamine. But yes, totally agree with you, Dr. Maud, and thank you very much for your commentary. Yeah, uh, I've just uh, added in the comments uh, because, uh, you know, I, I just rushed through that uh, part. Uh, so I'm just clarifying that it's not evidence-based and uh, I have not uh, suggested that coma cocktail can be used as such, but the components like uh, dextrose uh, should be in, in our at the back of our minds if uh, it is something like hypoglycemia, which is causing uh, the patient to be combative. Yeah, specific okay. theme to speak. And I hope that we will prepare for the next Wonka, by the way. We will try, try to prepare another session of the approach to the aggressive patient, paying more attention to the psychiatric pathology or elderly people, that these patients are more the category of complicated, difficult patients. So if you are interested in, we will maintain you informed. Okay, thank you everyone. That brings us to the end of the webinar today. So thanks very much for coming. Um, we have recorded it and we will upload it to the YouTube channel um, of the Wonka Young Doctor Movement. Um, so as Elena was saying, um, the webinar was a collaboration between the European Young Family Doctors Movement and the Wonka Emergency Medicine SIG. So the contact details of the uh, Wonka Emergency Medicine SIG are on the slide and also of the EYFDM ultrasound group um, on the bottom left. Um, for any of you who don't know, EYFDM is, is Wonka Europe's Young Doctor Movement and we organize um, exchanges and um, educational conferences for, for trainee and recently qualified family doctors across Europe. Um, I'll put our website in the chat, so if you're interested, I hope you can look us up. And that's it for today, and um, have a nice rest of the weekend. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you Actually, very much, be guys. Before I go, I think special thank you to Elena for coordinating everyone, um, because it was a lot of work to, to do the webinar, and she really kept us all in check. And thanks also to our interpreters. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Alina. Thanks, Stuart. Bye. Yeah. Have a thank nice you, Sunday everyone. evening, everybody. Good night. Night, Bye. night. Thank you. Gracias a todos. Hasta luego. Un abrazo. Muchas gracias, Miriam. Muchas gracias, gracias por tu esfuerzo. Miriam. Ya sabemos que ha sido súper complicado. Sí. sí, pero vale la pena. 
Muchas gracias, guapa. Gracias. Chao, ping pong. Bye. Hasta luego. Muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias, Carlos. Muchas gracias.